take two. My tablet is... It's developed this little quirk where... I guess I need to get a new one pretty soon because these things, this technology is just, it's not built to last um, any conceivable amount of time. Uh, anyway, um... I try to start shooting something in the way of a video and then it'll just shut off and go right to the home screen again so I have to start over um, but I would like to go ahead and just talk about Jesus Christ as a man and the things that he stood for and how it differs how, how stark a contrast exists between that and Christianity as a religion and organized religion and the powers that are that uh, keep it running and keep everybody ignorant and in the dark and turn out just generation after generation after generation after generation of bigots and male chauvinists and people who just have nothing but hate in their hearts and they do it in the name of love and they say if you don't if you don't agree with me you're going to go to hell. And uh, God agrees with me. No. Now, Jesus Christ is pretty much the same kind of person as I am in many ways. He is, was, is, I don't know, uh, very loving, compassionate, caring, kind, you know, all the things that pretty much the establishment just hated and couldn't stand. The people that are uh, in power and that consider themselves authority figures in uh, religious circles such as clergy uh, are the same people who are responsible for killing Jesus. And they they are they are the same people that look at people such as myself and um, just start asserting their supposed authority. over me now this there's this church here in town in Shreveport which is now I refer to as San Diego it has been transplanted from San Diego California and just plopped right here brick by brick and just about everybody that lived in San Diego is now here in Shreveport and when they see me they look down their noses because I'm scruffy, I'm not a teeny bopper, I think for myself, I question authority on a regular basis, I know how to talk back, and I do that also on a regular basis, I know how to say no and walk away. Now there's this church called the, the, the Highland Center that is pretty much at the center of this incredibly trashy and scuzzy neighborhood nearby, about a 15 minute walk that, that pretty much reminds me of North Omaha and we're talking Nebraska, where I lived for a total of eight years and was mugged 
several times in that period. Um, and the only people that lived there besides me, I mean, were just trash, just scum. And, um, and they were so self-righteous and smug and so, so sure of themselves, so, so just all that. Because they, they got a Bible that they just memorized. And, um, they say, you got to believe, you got to, you got to be saved by Jesus. You got to do this and you got to do that, but it'll never, ever, ever be enough. You just got to do it every Sunday for the rest of your life. And so I started going to this, this church, which seemed at first to be nice, but then I started just getting this, this feeling, this, this nagging feeling deep inside that was just saying, John, this is no different from the church that brought you up. Because the church that brought you up is completely different than it was before. There was a feeling of just having a, a, a sacred experience when I was going there as a kid to, to Holy Cross. And um, I tried going back there earlier this year and um, they had changed so many parts of the service and they just just flat out omitted all things come of the old Lord and of thine own have we given thee they changed they took out, holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory, Hosanna in the highest, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna, and they just took that completely out. And now they say, instead of uh, in remembrance of me, as in do this in remembrance of me, now they say, do this for the remembrance of me. And there's a huge difference when you just change a couple of words. And uh, and what, what really just kind of pisses me off now is that every church that I have ever been a part of for any length of time at all for the past 10 years is just hooked on social media such as Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. None of these are words. And um, they just they just swear by it. And you know, I have to mention that I, I had a Facebook account for a couple of years when I was living in that trashy center in North Omaha, which was just a hub of drug dealers, roaches, vermin, bedbugs, and other assorted trash. And I spent just literally almost two years signing on to my Facebook account almost every day. And just every single soul that I encountered just every single one every single one was judgmental condescending self-centered self-obsessed and self-everything it was all about them and I came to the conclusion 
after I deleted my Facebook icon out of my phone before before you, that while that was still something you could actually do. Now you can't get rid of it. It's just a fixture. I, I encountered just nothing but just a series, just this unbroken line of letdowns, disappointments, betrayals, and two-faced, idiotic, uneducated morons who used Facebook to debunk, demoralize, insult, and put down and traumatize people just like me just because I was kind I was considerate sweet affectionate caring compassionate They, that that little platform for bullies and show-offs, are one of the major players in the fact that I overdosed on the night of November 11th of last year because they just trashed my self-image. So I went to a Bible study yesterday and it wasn't really, it, they, we, we didn't even look at the Bible, I don't know why they called it that, uh, in which some California transplanted nut who was just as controlling as somebody who, was, who facilitated a group therapy session for mental health or what passes for it. Um, I started telling my story. I started talking about what what happened to me last year, and I I was not able able to uh, really make my point because he was just like before I was able to you know get to the part where the you know the blessing part where you know I was rescued at just the last second from just being devoured and falling into a very large, deep, dark, black hole from which I would never be able to climb out. He just complete. he was like, and so when are we going to get to the blessing part? And I'm like, well, if you just shut up and listen, I'll get to it. And uh, so that, that whole that experience that lasted only an hour was so triggering because everybody there just sent out this cold little shiver of fear as if I was some kind of threatening influence or like I was going to Ramp their style. And so I composed a little note this morning and I put it in an envelope. And I referred to um, how Shreveport, in the 35 years that I've been gone, has turned into San Diego and a combination of that and North Omaha, which is, as I mentioned, an extremely scuzzy 
and filthy area of town where only people who were considered society's rejects were allowed to live. They don't call it subsidized housing for nothing. You know, emphasis on sub. And so, um, you know, I wrote this note pretty much, and I referred to how in the 35 years that I've been gone and, and, and in the year that I've been back, I've noticed that it's just turned into San Diego. There's this... There's this, this snooty little elite little restaurant that's so it's such it's it's just this campy little cute little little spot where all the all the snooty and uppity um, perfect hairstyles and and just oh they're so they're just all that they're so perfect and they have the right clothes and they know the right people. And they take one look at me. And in the name of love, in the name of Christianity and religion and everything that's good and right, they think that they have leave because of their clothes and their makeup and their cars and their perfect little homes to look down their noses at someone like me. As if I'm some kind of little piece of shit on the street. And you know, the name of the restaurant that I'm referring to is called, get this, Fat Calf. And uh, so I mentioned that in the note. And I let them know that... Uh, this is the non-entity, John Green, who, by the way, has very clearly received the message that you sent yesterday by just completely cutting me off and just brushing me aside. All in the name of heaven, God, Jesus, and love. It makes me think of this song called 110 Soldier that I learned in camp when I was a boy. And I don't, it, it's something about like how, um, there was this there was this rumor of like this huge this really great treasure this of just just incalculable value um just just and and people were just went to war over who was going to find it first and people were killed by the thousands in the name of just getting their hands on this great treasure which they do, do it just in their greed and their their lust for power just couldn't wait to get their hands on and at the end the, the last stanza of the song and I'll I'll, 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 I'll I can recite word for word the actual chorus, and I'll tell you what that is in a second. At the end of the song, they finally get to this where the where this rumored treasure is, <laughs> and all they find is a piece of paper with three words written on it: "Peace on Earth." And the chorus goes as follows. Go ahead and hate your neighbor. Go ahead and cheat a friend. Do it 
In the name of heaven, you can justify it. In the end, there won't be any trumpets blowing. Come judgment day, on the bloody morning after, one ten soldier rides away. So I hope, you know, I'm not really counting on what I'm hoping will happen. But what I'm hoping will happen is that the people in, a, in supposed authority at that little hub, which is at the center of an extremely scuzzy part of town, uh, will take a moment to reflect about the way they thought it was perfectly acceptable to treat me like I was some five-year-old retarded half-wit in the name of love and Jesus and heaven and God. 